So uh, I would like to welcome you all on uh, the most recent SMART webinar organized by Bob Wilsack, devoted on the topic writing on the wall, otherwise uh, semiotic approaches to graffiti, street art, and vandalism. Uh, today's uh, webinar is divided in two sessions. In uh, uh, each session, we'll have a, a, a different presentation and uh, a different group of uh, commentators. Um, we will begin with, uh, well, let's add a, bit, a, 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 a little thing more. Uh, uh, in each session, uh, uh, presenters have uh, 30 minutes to do their presentation. And subsequently, we'll have a discussion between the commentators and the presentators. Um, audiences, audience can submit uh, questions or comments on the um, on the chat so that uh, our presenters will have the opportunity to uh, respond to them. Um, I wish you all um, a very fruitful, uh, smart webinar. Uh, I know it's going to be very smart and very fruitful, but I think it's going to be a bit long, but um, I think you will find it uh, very exciting. So uh, without uh, any more delay, uh, um, we'll begin our first session where uh, our presenter is Chris Martin who will be talking to us about his most recent uh, ongoing project on uh, graffiti. And our four commentators will be uh, Marcel Dadezi, Emeritus Professor of Semiotics at the University of Toronto, uh, Evripidis Adidis, Professor in Graphic Communication from uh, Technical University of Lemesos, Cyprus, uh, Thierry Mortier, uh, an artist and semiotician from Belgium who currently resides in Stockholm. And Thiago Müller, professor at the Universidade Católica Don Bosco at Santa Cruz del Sur in Brazil. Uh, dear Chris, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. Again, just quick word i really appreciate uh paul buizak and i uh, bring this all together and i really appreciate the slogan uh, uh whoever you are wherever you are i think it's i think it's perfect so uh with that said i'm going to share the screen um and bring it bring it all to you uh let's see google chrome i'm just going to come back to my beginning here okay so um yeah, I'm going to talk about graffiti. I'm going to make that concept. Uh, we're going to define it. We're going to look at the history. We're going to do a little bit of everything with it. Um, but I think we have to begin with uh, the graffiti towers in Los Angeles. Um, if you haven't heard, uh, as of the beginning of this month in, in downtown Los Angeles, there's been a, a, a massive movement. And in fact, I'll, I'll read here. Located next to the inspiringly named crypto.com arena in downtown los angeles a collection of unfinished luxury towers owned by chinese developers who quote ran out of money as of 2019 have now been bombed by a coordinated effort of dozens of graffiti writers since the beginning of february with this within the span of days a large portion of the building uh, was tagged each writer respecting the code and giving each other space and respect over 30 stories graffiti tags make a mockery of the buildings and they become instantly iconic signs of the way graffiti as a form of culture jamming provides voice to the voiceless in a time of unaffordable housing and growing inequality among the rich and the remainder. Um, we're going to see that uh, a big portion of the presentation today is I'm going to look at this concept of culture jamming and then its ties to uh, this concept of the semiotic gorilla, which was uh, developed by uh, Umberto Eco. Uh, but let's let's have a I just want to show you real quick. Um, the videos 
because I think they're uh, they really are something. Let's start with this one. Also new tonight, a crime with a massive canvas, if you will, in the world of graffiti, you can hide it. Perhaps never before has it happened in such a bold and dramatic way. The building sitting in the shadow of the crypto arena. It was supposed to be 40 stories of luxury condos. A building that was supposed to revitalize the neighborhood has become a symbol of greater problems. I especially like there that it's become a symbol of uh, of greater problems. Indeed, it has. Um, but what what are the problems? One of the uh, pro perhaps most amazing things about all of this is you can follow down the rabbit hole and you can see some of these. Uh, writers um, making their way up, you know, t 10, 20, 30, 40 stories. And uh, you can read stories of, you know, ones that they stopped as soon as their knees were going weak from climbing the scaffolding. And that, and that's where they tried. But again, the respect that you see is amazing. Uh, and then I'll just quickly show this one because I think it's, uh, again, it shows the the heights that which people have to go to be able to make their message uh, known in a world like this, so. NBC4's Alex Rozier has the latest. Shocking video shared on Instagram appears to show someone paragliding from these unfinished towers downtown Los Angeles. The same unfinished towers that are also now tagged with nearly 30 floors of graffiti. Putting that graffiti up there that high is very, very dangerous. Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass said LAPD will surround the site until the developer secures it. We don't have any choice but to do that because people being in that building is extremely dangerous. The owner of the building should be held accountable and he should reimburse the city for every dime that is spent. Construction here halted in 2019 when the Chinese developers ran out of money. They so, you know, uh, the building has sat dormant for just about five years at this point, and it takes these kinds of actions to completely disrupt the everyday. And uh, I see it as a, as a continuum within this co this concept of culture jamming. So a culture jamming is a symbolic war where tools of irony and ridicule, ridicule are used against forces of power, oppression, and inequality. Uh, Cal, uh, Cal Lassen, who's... Um, uh, founder of the counterculture magazine Adbusters says it springs from a revolutionary continuum that includes punk rebels, hippies, situationalists, surrealists, Dadaists, anarchists, and all those who over the centuries fought against the mentality of the era in an original manner. Again, the, the fascinating thing about all of this is we've seen uh, now over, and there's over a quarter million clicks on the hashtag for LA graffiti towers and, you know, so it's it's becoming a massive movement and undeniable topic of discussion when luxury towers are built without any regard conversation. So it's it it's a good way of disrupting a narrative possible world. Again, another concept of Umberto Echoes that I'll, I'll discuss a little later. So um, I just wanted to quickly uh, point out that um, myself personally, in, in seeing this, it kept conjuring up Barbara Kruger's famous work, Who Owns What? Uh, so uh, Barbara Kruger, her, uh, known for her anti-capitalist texts, which are future, a font, white uh, with the red background, um, such as this one currently on display at the Tate Museum, ask questions like, who owns the world? Why do they own it? And is there another way? So um, I just want to give again, because I think it's 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 important Um I noticed this was uh, this the the importance of defining graffiti and really understanding a little bit of its history is I, I when I began studying it and I mean to see the passion of of people who are writing who are are tagging um, for the for the deep importance of understanding the terminologies and then also when you think about the law and vandalism and you think of and I'm sure we're going to hear we're going to hear all uh, this whole presentation from the different presenters about vandalism and you know the larger concepts of uh public and private property and so on and so forth again it's just really important to understand what we're dealing with so graffiti um has this etymological history the word itself comes from 
uh, graffito, uh, Italian for scratching or graphene and uh, Greek for, to write. Um, but typically it's an urban environment mark, uh, uh, illegal. And uh, again, mo in most cases uh, in which you have somebody making a canvas of their urban world and, and environment. Style writing or just writing are the terms given by uh, those in the world uh, for all of what you just saw in the LA Towers, those bold block letters that are 3D that become became more and more sophisticated uh, in the early 1970s, throughout the 70s and to today. That's what you saw there. Um, again, it's um, modern day graffiti. When we think of graffiti, really does have its origins to New York City and Philadelphia in the 1970s with the um, subway cars. Uh, latrinalia uh, is one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> latrinalia refers to the messages in public bathrooms, uh, comical, satirical, sexual, political texts, and images meant to disrupt the regular flow of everyday social behavior in public places. Again, one of my, I just, it's, it. every time I see something like this, it, it's truly a joy, but, <laughs> um, and this, this I found, uh, again, very important. And when, uh, before we, um, in our preparation for today, we were talking just now, Paul Guizak was talking about an online encyclopedia for semiotics, which is always being updated. And I think, obviously, of course, that's important in a world where information changes. Um, but uh, one of the uh, really important texts, I think, in, in graffiti is, uh, is this Encyclopedia of Graffiti, which was published in 1974, and it was the same year the author died, Robert Risner, who was a jazz writer for the Village Voice, and he's credited as teaching the first academic class on graffiti. But I, I love his quote, how he begins his book. He says, sometimes the humblest and most pervasive activities are the most important in the study of mankind, and yet they are often overlooked. Graffiti has been with us since prehistoric man placed his hand on a cave wall and traced the outline of his fingers with pigment. It was his way of saying, I exist. And for my presentation, again, uh, this and the next couple of slides are about the fact that graffiti was a, is, has been and will always be about having a voice, especially in a world where voices are drowned out and only certain voices are heard. But well, I'll also be developing how graffiti is a weapon, not just a voice. Um, this is uh, credited uh, here, it's 1971, uh, July, 21st. This is credited as the first mainstream media um, discourse written about graffiti practices. It's in New York City. It's Tacky 183. And uh, again, it's uh, Alan Kett, who is um, the co-founder and owner of the Museum of Graffiti in, in Miami and the author of a very important book on graffiti and a new book. Um, he points to this, this article as the first uh, mainstream media attention on the, on the practice. This one here from 1973, I think is extremely interesting for us because um, just this quote here, I've kind of zoomed in and grabbed this part here. It says this, this is uh, when graffiti first go, comes to a gallery. It's the City University, City College of New York. Um, there's a student there who, who uh, rallies to get a group of graffiti artists together called the United, United Graffiti Artists, UGA. And uh, right here it says this, in any case, the new graffiti fueled by the volcanic energy of ghetto kids is obviously unstoppable. We might as well make the best of it, which is what an organization called United Graffiti Artists, headed by a man named Hugo Martinez, has been doing. UGA have brought together veteran graffitists, sworn them to quit their illegal activities, and directed them toward more professional careers. Let's see. So... It couldn't be long until this guy came in. Here we have Banksy. Um, this is where, again, I'm going to sort of make a, uh, this is where graffiti becomes a weapon uh, beyond just a voice. And uh, I mean, it, it's always a weapon, of course, but I think that Banksy is undeniable in terms of his his reach, in terms of bringing attention to, the, to this art. And so um, style writing of graffiti in the 1970s, turns to the Bristol UK born Banksy's work on social criticism and political discourse. So uh, in an article for the Journal of Co Cognitive Semiotics uh, called Armed with Irony for a Semiotic Gorilla, uh, Paolo Eduardi writes about the ways protesters today wield the very semiotic objects, or, or artifacts rather, 
of those they oppose, such as multinational corporations or unregulated political powers. They utilize culture jamming by making a farce of the very symbols these groups use for their power. Edwardi writes, the key point of jammers' activity is their original way of fighting, which combines the actions of these different groups. They manipulate corporations' semiotic artifacts, such as the logos, the payoffs, the advertising campaigns, and the merchandising. Uh, really what they're trying to do is um, take away a sick message and uh, superimpose a clean cultural idea. Um, and so we see this with uh, Banksy throughout his career. In 2018, in the, during the Par Paris Fashion Week, Banksy created several pieces throughout the city. And this is when, I again, he's becoming ever more bold, emboldened and... Um, and because at, by this stage, people are already trying to go and collect his pieces as quick as they come up, that they have just the voices is, is undeniable, his reach. And then the so the power of the weapon becomes even more um, forceful. So right here we see uh, a young girl, uh, the teddy bear, and you see the layers. You see the layers of meaning here because you see the the pretty Victorian era wallpaper um, display. Uh, only barely covering a swastika. And um, this is from a, a journal, uh, Colossal, uh, who commentate here that this is uh, this was painted um, very close to um, Paris's refugee camp, Le Bull, um, in August 2017. Uh, it was a city within a city, a home to makeshift camp of over 2,700 refugees, and was dismantled about 35 times before 2,000 migrants were bused to temporary shelters. This was part of Emmanuel Macron's wish to remove the refugees off the streets and out, out of the woods, as stated during his campaign. So we see this, again, commentary on veiled attempts to hide more sinister politics, whether it be fascist politics or just politics of, of othering, of, um, of ignorance and those types of things. This one here. Uh, again, this is where, you, again, you really see a great example of this semiot semiotic guerrilla concept, but we'll define that right now, actually. This is uh, from Umberto Eco, as quoted in this Cognitive Semiotics journal, and uh, looking into it, it just becomes a really inspiring concept. The semiotic guerrilla criticizes the notion of a unidirectional flow of information in a society increasingly exposed to mass communication. He claims that this flow can be interrupted or deviated by someone positioned between the utterer and the addressee. This person has the power to change the meaning of the text, offering a new interpretation and a critique of the original message. Thus, the semiotic guerrilla is a resistive tactic employed by subordinate groups in constructing counter-hegemonic meanings for media texts. Um, so during that same uh, Paris Fashion Week, this proud image of French culture, present, uh, which is on display in the Louvre, um, Napoleon crossing the Alps, neoclassicist painting from what is this, 18, between 1801 and 1805, turns to this uh, with the cape covering the eyes, covering the head. An aloof Napoleon doesn't know where he's going. Um, this, of course, is, yeah, again, commentary on French government with a cape in front of their eyes, either willfully or foolishly ignorant, ignoring the world around them. It's a mockery, and it's a mockery in the most powerful of terms because, again, you use art history, you use iconic images of culture, and you turn that into a joke. The irony of that can, it's just so powerful that it demands now in new interpretations. And better yet, you can't see the original without thinking of the new one, which means that it has, in theory, permanently disrupted the original meaning, even of something that's a couple hundred years old. There can be nothing more powerful than than that in some ways. Really, it's it's fascinating. So from there, I just have to I have the shirt on. <laughs> we have to talk uh, quickly about um, the girl with balloon transforming to love is love is the bin. Um, this is uh, captured as the gift during the moment in which Banksy's again. It, it's it's unclear, you know, there's debate about whether the, the auction house Sotheby's was in on it or Banksy had whatever. But the point is, is uh, to this day, the, the common understanding here is Banksy installed a shredder in his iconic girl with balloon, uh, which just after the gavel hit for over a million dollars at auction, 
uh, began to self shred. The shredder malfunctioned halfway. Um, and famously, then in 2021, so a couple of years later, three years later, it sold for over $17 million more than the original selling price because now it's again garnered this iconic status. So here we see. Here we see the uh, the next one. This this gentleman was said to have been very nervous to strike the gavel that it would shred further. Um, but this just further cemented Banksy as a household name. Um, here is a local uh, artist to where I am. I'm in Ottawa, Canada. And uh, Mark Adornado is a great example of a semiotic gorilla who began his, his art uh, history uh, working in graffiti um, and now just does in, in all kinds of mixed media. Um, for example, one of his uh, well-known practices is to go to the thrift stores and buy those benign symbols of landscape painting. You know, you just walk by these and he superimposes, he paints over um, hazmat masks. And this one is a commentary on mercury levels still rising near Grassy Narrows, First Nation, Indigenous Peoples uh, in 2023. Again, in Canada, it's a perfect example of this country, which prides itself on all kinds of symbols of connection and kindness belonging all of these all of these um you know like these these mythologies oh canadians are polite and they say they're sorry all of these things are again made a mockery of when you have a, a nice landscape painting is is as show is giving you the tool to show you that there's poison in in the system this one here is one of my favorites in fact i have it actually uh hung uh, I have uh, one of the copies hung in my office above me here. Um, this is uh, Arby, who was the mascot for the Royal Bank of Canada at the time, a cute cartoon mascot meant to, I guess, soften the bank's image. Um, but in this case, he's burning down. <laughs> he's burning down uh, because he's he's protesting how his job has been outsourced to India. Uh, this was when there was famous waves made about how kinds of all kinds of jobs were being outsourced. And, you know, just everyday examples, the wasting of Bruce fruit. You have graffiti on the crucifixion. So um, what we see then is the gorilla and I, the gorilla gorilla. Uh, the reason why I put this here is in my mind, I imagine between the signifier and the signified, I imagine a gorilla <laughs> You know, it's how we work, right? The multimodality of it all. I picture it. Anyway, he's pulling apart this signifier signified and he's he's imposing his own interpretation with on it within it. So Umberto Eco is interested in these narrative possible worlds that are conveyed to readers of a text. And they become so engulfed in these desired interpretations of the sign that the possibility of an outside world goes away. So this is again culture jamming historically has been about that, which is like a cold splash of water onto the face of people so engulfed within a world that they can't imagine any world within or without these current symbols and, and icons and meanings. Um, uh, in terms of culture jamming, you have this famous um, ad busters where they use the Calvin Klein marketing of nude or models and just underwear uh, against them by uh, that word obsession, which is again, just part of the, of the, the strategy of Calvin Klein marketing. Uh, you have instead a model looking nervously down at their body and then you put the word obsession and you turn the word obsession into an ironic symbol of all kinds of problems, but not the kinds of things that that a company like Calvin Klein would want. So again, the gorilla, semiotic gorilla is a very interesting concept. Um, I'm heading down uh, in about a week, a week and a half to uh, to, my, to Florida, to Miami, Florida, uh, which I'm looking forward to because it's very cold here. Uh, right now. And I'm heading back to the Museum of Graffiti, which is located in this neighborhood of called Wynwood Walls. And um, uh, I'm going to be interviewing the co-founder of the museum, uh, Alan Kett, who is, again, I really, really respect him. He's been in, he's originally from Brooklyn, New York, and he's been within the world of graffiti and he's been all over it in terms of, yeah, from prison up till the co-owner of, of, of the first museum of, of graffiti. So he's, he's got this amazing history. I'm really looking forward to speaking with him. And at the same time, Wynwood Walls, I think is a perfect example of how complicated the world of graffiti currently is. We have in this area, there's over 35,000 square feet of outdoor exhibits 
of graffiti from the likes of Shepard Ferry, Osgimos, um, and over a hundred more. They're commercial, they're sanctioned, they're tourist locales, they, they're paid admission, but what they do is they they are iconic of, again, this this trend, and I here's a book from uh, 2010, it's by sociologist Richard Lloyd, of these areas called neo-Bohemias, which uh, Lloyd describes as urban, post-industrial urban spaces that in the second half of the 20th century became m major hubs for artists um, and creatives and, and so on, uh, musicians, where they're able to emerge out of the garbage left behind by capitalism, suburbs, sprawl and exodus and urban decay. And Wynwood Walls is no exception. It's a perfect example of this. It's a place where a factory actually is now the Museum of Graffiti. And you have this exodus of the of the industrial era, but within it, you uh, when, when it exits, you have this potential for urban art. Again, but it asked it just coming back to the beginning of my presentation and that Barbara Kruger who owns what, it also raises the question, what does it take for us to be able to have art within a city that's not just a on a billboard selling us English muffins or something? What 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 does it take for us to be able to have to live in a world surrounded by art? Do we have to have it only if it's commodified and commercial? And or if it's only if it's within the uh, the ashes of garbage of post-industrial neighborhoods. So it, it again it raises questions about who owns what, why do they own it, and is there any other way? I'll just quickly show you um, what Wynwood Walls looks like because it really is something. Um. So yeah, seventy-five thousand gallons of paint, hundred thousand spray cans, three million visitors per year, hundred artists, and it it's just. Um, it's just a sight to behold because again, you see the possibilities of here, here, right here. This is this is um, Shepherd Ferry, uh, uh, who is behind that very popular Obey brand. But he um, he he became um, well known during uh, Barack Obama's first um, run for president when he created the Hope poster. But anyways, um, so there's very world famous graffiti artists, and uh, it's just a perfect example of where we could be going if we can understand and appreciate the powers of giving voice and giving, giving agency to those who previously do not have it. Um, this is the thing, historically graffiti has been, you know, young people um, who, who sprawl and crawl up very dangerously to be able to get their message out. And, uh, you know, while there's an increasing interest in street murals that are funded and, and paid for by city officials and so on and so forth, there's still this extreme underappreciation or under misunderstanding graffiti. And then there's uh, there's this constant um, misuse of vandalism graffiti, just they go back and forth. And there's 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 no consistency to how people define these things. And with that said, I will uh, end my presentation there. But um yeah, thank you, and I, and I look forward to hearing uh, from from the um, the panelists. Hopefully, that was twenty Wait, minutes. Space. Uh, you can uh... right now. Uh, we are ready to begin our discussion, and uh, I will uh, invite. Uh, Marcel Danesi to open our discussion with his thoughts on uh, Chris' presentation. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions I have, but I found the um, uh, lecture quite informing and at times even quite brilliant. I do, do like the angle that it, uh, the walls of the city streets or any walls can be used to express ideologies, politics, and also as a subversive act against dominance and hegemony in the society. I'm going to take it from a little different angle um, because I see also graffiti art, and I kind of mentioned this in a book I wrote for Paul's series, Warning Signs, as the walls creating a kind of a canvas for the art instinct to manifest itself. I'm going to read something very briefly um, on a graffiti, graffiti artist, not mentioned, um, but should be mentioned, whose name is Keith Haring, H-A-R-I-N-G, who used the city streets and graffiti art 
as his art canvas. Um, and the reason why I became involved with um, Herring is I was asked by the Vienna Museum of Art several years ago to look at it from a semiotic angle and write down my um, opinions about Herring. And um, I, it was a revelation for me, um, a true revelation, because in some ways, and as was mentioned today, kind of brings us back to the origins of the anonymous art form, just there to express something, a, a feeling of existence that we are there. Anyhow, in my view, the some of this art that I saw today, and certainly Keith Herring's art, uh, does bring us back to the ancient um, murals and caves, but which are projected almost like archetypes, artistic archetypes into the streets of the contemporary world and certainly in cyberspace as well. Many of the uh, memes, I guess, that are seen, the visual memes are kind of graffiti, I guess, perhaps an area for another, another <laughs> uh, type of investigation. Anyhow, and this is really, in a sense, art for art's sake. Mm. Although it can be used for political or ideological subversive reasons. In a way, what I saw in Herring's art is that it connects contemporary people to their archetypal origins. So what stands out to me is its ingenious use of signs, symbols that reverberate with ancient meanings, axes, um, animals, um, which are then recycled almost a la Bart. <laughs> To, um, to, to fit in with the contemporary world. So in this way, I named him a semiotician <laughs> in the most basic sense of the term, a seeker of hidden meanings through the filter of signs and symbols. Now, um, in some ways, and I saw that most of this art could probably be classified as naive in a very basic way. I mean, it's understood by children to be written, you know, and it doesn't need any real, how can I say, training, adestramento of any kind. Um, and in fact, many of Herring's um, graffiti uh, are about childhood ideas, Disney cartoons, the Looney Tunes, Peanuts comics, Dr. Seuss children's books, and all these themes come out in little bits and pieces that in his art form, um, the viewer has to connect to their own life and to the overall flow of culture as it unfolds every day. In some ways, it is akin to the art of Jean Dufay, who drew his chief inspiration from graffiti in the art produced by children and mentally challenged people and primitive cultures. Therefore, challenging the historically conditioned uh, artistic eye. Um, just one, one character in particularly that appears often in the graffiti is Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yeah. Greatest symbol of all of modern society. Is he subversive, Mickey Mouse? Is he uh, indicative of... Uh, of, um, of a hegemonic system of corporations? <clears throat> Is he both? Um, anyhow, the way he presents him in one of his, I wish I didn't know how to do this, but is Mickey Mouse trapped in a, in a, in a television set with a crystal ball on top um, and showing that it's looking down on Mickey Mouse trapped inside. And that is indeed it the reality of modernity, the medium of television traps us um, to, in childhood to receive its magical waves from, when, from wherever they emanate. On the side of, the, of Herring's TV, we see figures representing devices for adjusting images and sound, but these recall the same kind of petroglyphs, They're triangles, squares, circles that go right back to the beginning of time. Uh, I guess the idea is that we are living in a magical box and that this can only be shown on the streets of people who, who see it in everyday life. And I, anyway, I'll stop there and say that long before Banksy, 
this kind of art, which seems to be ad hoc, spontaneous, is really an art form that goes back to the beginning of time. I, I started reading when I preparing for this about the uh, graffiti that were found in um, Renaissance Florence, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which had humanistic um, ideas in them against the church, um, but also could be interpreted in a, a more metaphysical way as a revival of ancient symbols, Greek and other symbols, and also mathematical symbols, which were starting to be, become be, um, not, not only symbols for for uh, the use in numeration and, and uh, you know, mathematics itself, arithmetic, but also for a kind of numerological, metaphysical view of the world. If you uh, subscribe to this number and you live on this street and the street number is this, then you are entering into a, a domain of the metaphysical. This I found to be extremely crucial in the study of graffiti. I should tell you as well that I am preparing for the, the Zodiac lecture and I found a lot of Zodiac signs and graffiti in Florence. I started with Florence. Um, I didn't find them in any of Keith Herring's art. Thank you for that. Now I have three specific questions um, based on the um, lecture. First of all, Yes, there is a culture jamming element, a kind of sub a political subversion to many uh, of the uh, graffiti art forms that we find today. Certainly the one of the Chinese building, is, is, it's that. Is there any research, empirical research in the social or psychological science that says that people actually look at these it has an effect on them and changes behavior. The reason why I say, I, said, I say this is when I was researching my book on warning signs, I actually found that there is research. The problem is the age in which we live in that uh, creates what is called source amnesia, according to neuroscientists. Source amnesia is you mm. see something and we're conditioned to forget it right away. It goes down an Orwellian memory hole instantly. Is there any way to allow this art this culture jamming, you know, of any research to make it stick, stick in the brain. First question. Second, cannot the same walls be, you know, co-opted by people who are on the other side, let's say conspiracy theorists who mm -hmm. want to promote falsehoods rather than, you know, critiques or parodies of the world as it is. Anyhow. Those are my two questions. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I um, I think about something actually, uh, Marcel. That you you said years ago at a conference uh, when I first met you. It was in Toronto, the Semio Fest, and uh, I still think about it actually. And you said you were talking about um, people walking around campus, and there's no one walking around with necessarily with books anymore in their hands, oh. and how that used to be able to be. It used to tell you about you know, what they were studying, what they were interested in. And uh, I, I still think about that. Um, it's true. And I also think, I, and then I, at the time I suggested maybe the tattoos have kind of substituted for that. And anyway, all that to say is I'm always interested in ways in which people can communicate meaning through the, through to others uh, in the world. And I, again, I think graffiti is a way of doing that. And maybe um, that'll I kind of, I'll answer the second question by saying um, the, the, the you are you are right, and I think of uh, there are uh, for sure various examples where I mean propaganda certainly, but um, I think about um, yeah. So in reference to this second question, that you know the meanings, it's not it's not always going to be about subverting inequality and and so on and so forth. It could be about uh, reperpetuating um, inequality or or whatever the case may be, or just there's so many different ways it could be done. I think about this ad campaign that happened uh, years ago. It was by this uh, this guy named Brian Holiday, who's now this well-known guy on stoicism and so on. But before that, he he was famous for for this kind of guerrilla marketing. And they were promoting this movie at the time about, um, it was about like this uh, young people culture of like, um, you know, uh, misogyny and so on. And they purposefully went out and um, put graffiti on their own billboards to try to, uh, and, and and successfully so convinced people 
that there was a movement against their movie in order to have more more and more people talking about their own movie. And as a result, they made themselves get more sales and more famous um, just by kind of manipulating the idea that you were pretending to subvert your message. So there's a, you know, all the layers to the semiotic gorilla here. Uh, there's a gorilla behind the gorilla. It's uh, it was kind of uh, so there's there's yeah, you're right. So it's not it's not going to be I, I pick these examples because, you know, I'm eternally I find these inspiring, but there's, there's they're not out there. They can be dark. And to your to your first um, question, I think I was actually reading an article um, and it was from a sociologist. And it was in a uh, I could find it and uh, and share it with you. But it was basically um, trying to do with just that empirical research, trying to find out what ways culture jamming may have actually impacted and changed people. And I can't remember how she, she had three kind of concepts and one of them was shame. I remember this one, shame. Um, culture jamming at its finest is meant to, yeah, it's meant to pull you out of the world, out of that narrative possible world in, um, in Umberto Echo's term. But uh, again, the shame part of it is if you can, if you could feel shame, it, it might just pull you out of it. And I'll, I'll tell you an example of this. I actually thought about this. I was actually looking for a, a, a sweater the other day at stores. And I went into a store and I was looking through the sweaters and I was looking for my size. And one of the tags was sewn on upside down. And uh, it made me feel shame because I was looking for the cheapest sweaters and, you know, they were all made in Bangladesh. And as soon as now this was just an accident, but it nonetheless, it stuck with me. I, I, I had to leave the store. Sorry to intermeddle, but if we let the speaker answer the questions, we are here until tonight. So right. the speakers should rest answer the questions at the end of the questions. Okay. Okay. Because right. because you know you unflow and then you you flood uh, jamming. You know it's a webinar jamming. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's good. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. Sorry, uh, 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 Chris, you can, you can uh, take up the thread, uh, uh, if you like, at the end of the comments. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, our next uh, commentator, uh, Evrepidis and Davis, to contribute to our discussion. Hello there, Chris. Thank you for a wonderful and inspiring, informative presentation that um, covers a lot of fascinating things. Uh, it has been a really fruitful and enjoyable uh, experience. From the perspective of, of graphic design, graffiti has always been an interesting and uh, fascinating field to explore because it combines um, all these typographic elements as well. It's about uh, visualization of the verbal language and introducing a specific uh, style and uh, uh, visualizing this protest and um, uh, re revolutionary against um, the system, political or sociological other messages. And of course, the work of Ad Pastors, the way you have presented it, it makes absolutely sense. And uh, to be very briefly, um, I'm, I think I have three questions that we would like to uh, discuss about. Um, a lot of the examples that we we have seen in your presentation um, are uh, they have this intertextual reference. And to to what extent do you think this ad subversive and ad pastor approach that we seen also in the works of Barbara Kruger um, is um, a required uh, pre-assumption that you know the audience has to be aware of a pre-existing image or pre-existing visual in order to well, construct this um, uh, um, breaking through messages through graffiti. And um, I was wondering if you have um, observed in your research um, any form of um, um, uh, semiotic observations in the linguistic messages depending uh, on their type. If they are political, for example, if they are religious, what kind of uh, linguistic rhetoric do they use? As well as if you have ever noticed uh, any um, semiotic remarks regarding public spaces, are there other than the toilets and the uh, and the messages that you are fascinated with, uh, are there any 
Of course, the abandoned spaces you've shown us were amazing. However, uh, have you observed any semiotic um, uh, remarks regarding um, spaces and meaning, spaces and meaning with uh, graffiti and the way that uh, um, in, is visualized in, in specific areas? And finally, if you have any remarks or any comments to make on the graphic design aspects, does are there any codes? Are there any specific colors and typefaces and um, combinations of indexical or symbolical uh, visuals um, related with specific semiotic patterns? And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vipiris. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Thierry Mortier to further advance our discussion with his comments. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Chris, for a, for a great talk. Uh, this is going uh, in so many directions and I think that's really interesting uh, overall. Um, in terms of comments and questions, I, I just took some notes while you were talking uh, and it, it went everywhere and it is connected already in your work. And I think one of the things is Barbara Kruger really is at the center of this all because it really is about that question. Uh, and I think everybody knows that, that graffiti ha is, is a label that we put on something that is coming from a certain position and perspective. And it connects also with what Marcel uh, Danisi said earlier. One thing that I'm really interested in is, is when from a position of power, you label something as being a crime or vandalism of of defacing uh, property and you you really go into that concept of property who who is when is it justified okay so if you deface something with with graffiti and then you are the the, the vandal but perhaps claiming the property in the first place was already vandalism so that that's this nice tension that we know that is really at the at the core of this vast subject that you are tackling right now because it's already vast in what you showed in the presentation you you come from the street that there's the tagging there's there's the banksy there's the banksy in the street there's the banksy in the in the art museum and and the money so yeah, uh, respect for for tackling something that's so big already. Because from a semiotic perspective, that my interest really lies in how are you going to untangle all of these things. And I'm thinking that, and I think Marcel already said it, it's really about the line of identity on the existential graph. We just want to make our mark. Mm. And it is this conversation of making our mark but with it, within a larger perspective of something that's societal, then it's about giving voice to the people and who is representing th those people then. So, so I wrote something down like, okay, the semiotic gorilla, I actually didn't know uh, Eko had, had formulated that term, but it does apply to both sides. Meaning when you take a look at public arts and how that comes to be through political uh, or even state-funded state, state funded commissions bringing a statue in your square or then just the people actually putting something there. So both sides can always claim uh, a, a kind of sem semiotic guerrilla position. It depends if, if there is a culture, cult, a dominant culture right now and somebody's coming in and trying to take it to a, a radical political shift somewhere else, they can do that from a political point of view and, and use graffiti, but it can also come from the people. So we're always looking at the same thing, but from different perspectives. Uh, is there a real question in that already? I don't know, but I th I thought I heard some already in your talk when you said it's... it's uh, there was great respect in the towers being shown by the graffiti artist. Then the fact that you 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 see that or or label it as showing great respect, it's great respect for the other people that are disrespecting the property. Mm -hmm. so th there's this constant loop that goes on. And I think that is already uh, something happening within culture jamming. Because if the, the museum you showed at the end, I think thought was brilliant. 
so much space and it's all very much curated and people get nice access to it. So they are mediated into this, this language that graffiti artists bring us. Uh, and uh, I forgot what the point I was going to make. Uh, Yes, I'm going to leave you at that. Uh, one question that I thought was uh, misdirection labels. Uh, labels that I believe are very misdirected uh, that we use constantly in our common speech is words that have such a laden meaning that they already justify the position of power, like civil disobedience. Is it really civil disobedience if it's against an unjust law? So it's it's that. Is there any way that a research like this, a graffiti, it is an umbrella term for a lot of things, but if you can dig deep into that, it would be able to show that it is just as justified to have this kind of graphic conversation in the public as the, the politicians have. Mm. So I'll leave it at that. But thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And uh, a round of uh, commentators for the first presentation uh, closes with uh, Thiago Müller. Uh... Uh, yes. Hey, Chris. Thank you one more time for your presentation. It was incredible. I'm so satisfied to be participating from this discussion. I just have one question. <laughs> It, it will be so more easier. Uh, considering considering the evolution of graffiti from street art to gallery, how does the semiotic nature of the transition impact the interpretation and reception of a graffiti with different cultural contexts? Mm. Mm. One more time, and thank you for all that incredible presentation. Thank you. Uh, Chris, now you can. I can answer? Yep. Okay. <laughs> you have the full range. Yes, sir, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll just, uh, uh, you know, I'll pick, uh, I'll pick and choose depending on what I already know and pretend like I didn't hear the rest. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so uh, let's, uh, in terms of the graphic design, I, 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 I have such a, um, an adoration and love for graphic design fonts. Um, I, I think it's the most, the most fascinating thing in the world uh, as well. Um, so that's something I'm going to look, I'm really looking forward to getting into deeper. Like when I've, when I uncovered the style writing and those big black block fonts. Um, it, so Alan Kent, again, in that book, it's called um, the wide world of graffiti. And so that's when he he's, he's, he's saying that those, that the emergence of that font in hip hop um, coincides with it, it, it being used in graffiti. And he kind of points out like uh, there's certain artists that kind of get credit. I think one of them is called phase two. He just died actually just a couple of years ago. He gets credited as one of the first to adopt these big block letters, and you know there, there's a functionality to that to be to be seen, to be read. Um, but then, and then there's the aesthetic beauty of it. Um, but in terms of, um, I, I'm I am genuinely very interested in looking way deeper into that subject to be able to understand. Um, yeah, you know, again, and maybe even uh, you may have noticed even in the the Prezi presentation. I um, mean, I have probably. Oh, so there, hold on there. I have probably like a, a dozen different fonts in my presentation. So that could have either bothered you or impressed you, depending on uh, uh, how, you know, how specific you are. But again, I, so I have a real uh, love for font and I'm going to look into it further. Um, so that's just, I think that's the only way I can respond to that. It's not something I've given a lot of thought to yet besides the style writing, that that's that very popular style. But I really want to be able to dig deeper into that. Um uh, to uh, to Terry's point um, about it being a, a massive subject, and um, it is, and uh, and you you ask how am I going to tackle it, and I think the thing about sem that's I think sem only semiotics in a way could, um, because it it demands that you be slow, be deliberate, 
be specific, be methodical. Like all of these qualities of semiotics, I think are exactly why it's the right discipline to study such a subject. Because again, you could look at the sociological, psychological, uh, all kinds of elements. And I think I will be doing that as well. But, um, and this is when I, uh, when I proposed the book for the, uh, for the series, there's not been really any full length, um, focus on, from semiotics or graffiti perspective. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do that, but again, only way I'm going to be able to do it is one at a time, one step at a time, taking it. And so th in the, in the case of this presentation, by dividing between the voice and the weapon, I think you can, uh, you can, you can, you know, because the voice is perpetual and it is historical and it is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a motif used throughout history for sure. Um, and so it, it's, so it has as a weapon as well. And so by, being able to at least delineate these these structure of the ways in which it's been used over time, I think I, I can uncover that a little bit more. Um, the same uh, line of identity through the existential, um, you know, I I can tell that it, that that quote from the Encyclopedia of Graffiti. A few of you mentioned it. That's why I had to put that sentence in. I I find it tragic that the gentleman died the year it came out, but. It's to show that I exist. I think there is something very powerful about that. And I, I could tell that it actually worked with each of you, which means that perhaps, again, if I've done my job today in that presentation, you're not going to be able to see things the same way when it comes to graffiti, because you're going to see it everywhere. And now all of a sudden, may, I might even pop in your head, um, which, again, goes to show that uh, it does just even, again, disrupting the everyday flow has this ability to change your interpretation forever. So if I can do that when it comes to, in a, in a book, when it comes to the messiness of language, graffiti, vandalism, um, it, it's important. One thing I, I should know, and this relates to everybody, including um, uh, Tiago's question, there is an ethics to this, right? There is, there is for me, there there is an ethic to, to me um, saying what's aesthetically good and bad, and what is, you know, it's all, you know, and so I, there's this quote in preparing for this, I was reading one of my favorite books, What Art Is by Arthur Danto. And he, he actually quotes uh, our friend C.S. Uh, Peirce. And Peirce has given this lecture and he's, and this is Peirce is saying, I find the task imposed upon me of defining the aesthetically good. I should say that an object to be aesthetically good, very difficult. And so he's, he's going on to talk about how difficult that is and in the case of graffiti, you know, you have curators of of a Winwood Walls exhibit, but as you say, if a tag on a piece of private property, as opposed to uh, a guerrilla movement on a on an abandoned luxury high rise from a Chinese developer, those those conjure up completely different feelings of value in in people's minds. And so there's value, there's ethics, there's politics, there's so many layers, and I'll, I'll have fun digging through them. With that said, I don't know if, the, if that answers enough questions, but I, I really appreciate everybody's questions and I've written them down. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank all the commentators for the insightful comments. Uh, I think uh, um, we would like to have uh, some more time to explore even further our points. Uh, but uh, unless there is some other uh, issue to be raised right now. Please allow me to uh, continue with uh, our second session and uh, invite uh, Carolina Cabre and uh, Red Cano Zacom, I hope I have pronounced it correctly, uh, to take the floor and uh, proceed with the presentation, please. Thanks so much. I'm just going to ask Rhett to uh, put up our yeah. slide. Perfect. Okay. Is it visible? Yes. Can thanks. you hear me? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. It just changed. Yeah. Okay. Can everyone see that? Um. I just wanted to say thanks again to for everyone for being here on a Sunday in February. We really appreciate your time. Um, we've we've been. This is the 
the book Proposal for Semiotics of Vandalism, A Spatial and Subversive Politics of Contestation. And we've we've been through a number of subtitles, so we're just very open to revising that. And, and that's uh, Rhett and myself. So what I'll be discussing today is basically some of the foundations and history of what we'll be looking at, starting with some of the semiotic phenomenology of Bruno Latour in his work on Iconoclash, and uh, including the history of the term of vandalism and the idea of defacement vis-a-vis -vis the politics of negation following uh, Michael Tossig's work. And of course, the semiotics of the gesture of defiance, spatialized and politicized and publicized following a Rob Shields, Henri Lefebvre and others. And then after that, Rhett is gonna talk about some of the specific cases and the specific audiences that we're gonna target and uh, that are targeted in each of the cases that, that we're gonna look at. Proximo. So, one of the, some of the questions that, that we'd like to ask are how acts of vandalism modify our understandings of various types of various types of frontiers and underscore the calls to break down barriers and dominant power dynamics, limiting autonomy and social sovereignty. Um, so we're looking at an embodied and gestural politics. We also ask what hidden histories and narratives conveyed by often subversive acts can be understood to have deep rooted cultural significance. So we're very um, sensitive to context in each case. And by semiotically examining ethical and aesthetic limits of vandalism in diverse lands landscapes, we ask if we could affirm this as some kind of facet of cultural heritage. And I'm gonna play out that connection in a minute. So the main objective of uh, semiotics of vandalism is to offer an interdisciplinary perspective of various acts of vandalism highlighting the narratives they convey in their inherent cultural property as acts of subversion, accountability, and resistance. And you can see there the recent throwing of soup at the, uh, at the uh, Mona Lisa in the Louvre. But this is nothing new. From the Taliban's destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan to the toppling of monument monuments around the world, the breaking, defacing of images has political, economic, religious, and cultural implications. The images or objects themselves become these sites of contestation where struggles are visibly marked, and we wish to attend to this. Now, many authors have written about how certain images, statues, paintings, and other symbols or objects attract attention, might be perceived as dangerous. And uh, when Dario Gamboni wrote his, his book on the destruction of art, it was the first substantial exploration of the destruction of art in the Western world after World War II. Um, and there are a number um, of works, uh, Baldrick, Brubaker, and Clay in 2013, they list some works that have addressed this topic, including negating the image, Case Studies in Iconoclasm in 2005, and Iconoclasm Contested Objects, Contested Terms in 2007. And we have Latour's work um, at the end of the 20th century as well on Iconoclash. But what we're proposing is to expand the conversation beyond the issues of defacement of art, to encompass a broader range of actions that semiotical analysis can show are connected on spatial and affective terms. Proximo. Um, so one of the questions uh, that it's good for us to play out is how did this concept of vandalism first arise? And I feel like my face is just over some of the writing there, but that's the credit to the picture. Um, okay, thanks. Um, in the huge volume accompanying the exhibition, Latour and Weeble's Iconoclash Beyond the Image Wars in Science, Religion, and Art, Latour explains how vandalism as a concept was invented at the same time and along with the idea of cultural heritage. He describes how during the French Revolution, coats of arms, statues, paintings, monuments, and buildings came under attack as symbols and instruments of, of, of power and the aristocracy um, whom they indirectly represented. So the king, the nobility, the church, they were first assaulted as surrogate targets um, and then in order to visualize the fall of the ancien regime, after which the remaining ones tended to be perceived as 
you know, an offense to republicanize. So what their defenders, what the defenders of the monuments uh, had to do was to sort of reinterpret them as historical monuments and works of art essential to the identity of the nation and of mankind. So that's how they created this notion of cultural heritage and coined the term vandal and vandalism to exclude those who continue to attack such objects uh, from the civilized community and banish them sort of from the domain. And in this um, picture, Le Soeur's Vandaliste, uh, you see him leaning against a statue he's broken and he's looking kind of inoffensive, but he's layered, labeled as a, as a destroyer of the production of the arts. Um, and art historian Louis Reo later extends this view to the interpretation of any damage done to art, defining uh, vandalism as Caliban's revenge. So this is sort of the root of that dynamic. And it's not to say that it wasn't happening for centuries before that, because with each new regime, the, the symbols and icons of the previous regime were systematically destroyed. And a lot of this continues to happen. Proximo. So just to play out a little bit, this idea of iconoclash uh, is what uh, Latour kind of plays out the nuance of the different kinds of iconoclasm and impulses behind uh, these uh, categories of vandalism. And the exhibition and catalog, um, which was basically a bunch of examples of, of this happening, he calls an archaeology of hatred and fanaticism. And he says the uh, exhibition tries to document, expose, and do the anthropology of a certain gesture, a certain movement of the hand. And the goals of Iconic Clash were to look at the goals of the icon smashers, the roles they give to the destroyed images, and the effects of on those who loved the images have. So they bring together three sources, religion, science, and contemporary art. But what we're going to foreground instead is the political and the social. So that's the shift in focus. Proximo. So he has uh, five categories. The A people, the people who hate all images and they want to feel, free the people who are trapped by the image. And so they feel they have to destroy the image to liberate people. And then there are the B people who are against you know, who feel that images change all the time, but it's the fact of being stuck to an image that's the problem. So the example they give is Jesus chasing the merchants out of the temple. And so the destruction of icons in that case is about getting your attention off the profane image to a true, more sacred image. But these two categories, and you'll see with the other categories Latour sets up, can all be confused. And, and there you have the sort of before and after in Afghanistan of the the blowing up of, of, of the Buddhas that had stood there for 1500 years, Proximo. And then we, we have the sea people who are not against images except those of their opponents. So they'll attack an image specifically because it's important to a particular groups. So this includes flag burning, the slashing of paintings by suffragettes, um, hostage taking type of examples. Um, uh, so there's no way for Latour to decide whether someone's acting as an A, a B or a C. They can all be accused of vandalism, but it's nuancing the what's behind these acts of, of icon iconoclasm. And then there are the D, the people who uh, are the innocent vandals who maybe by accident, uh, the people taking selfies who run into monuments and break them, or you know the the story of of Mr. Bean in the movie. So this is not a destruction out of hate; it's a destruction out of ignorance. Proximo. And finally, the E, the people who mock both iconoclasts and iconoph iconophiles, they want to show irreverence and disrespect. So. Um, what they have, what this is the the basic the this art piece is with the with the meteorite striking down Pope John Paul II is is an example of of this that Latour offers right. It's like you know we laugh at having images, and so this is this is basically the 
expose that that is done about um, these different ways of looking at iconoclasm and iconophilia that Latour calls iconoclash proxima. So many of the uh, factors involved in the Taliban's destruction of the Buddhas was part of this importance that was given to them as world heritage. So again, we have the tension between heritage and vandalism. And the Taliban themselves had criticized the international community uh, because they had refused to recognize the Taliban. And in addition to the iconoclastic argument that the statues were just stones, they didn't fail to contrast the outrage that was provoked by the destruction with the lack of international concern about the plight of the Afghan people. So Afghan people were starving and that wasn't important and the international community wasn't upset, but destroying statues that they saw as dead stones did get people upset. And that was what the point of this particular mode of, of vandalism was. It was a it was a statement in a sense. Um, so to transition to Rhett's part, we will examine the level of practice where in 2022, Sotiropoulos uh, was casting social spatiality as the mediating category between physical space and social being. So we're really looking at the relationship between physical space and social being as a process of, of creating new spatial relations. Um, and new forms of coexistence and and spatial justice. So part of the sort of under underline here is the idea that, you know, the image is dead, long live the image. And with that, I'll let uh, Rhett continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yep. The, so um, to retake a little bit uh, the, 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 the structure that we are following, for us, it's important to recognize how vandalism is not merely a destructive act, but uh, a meaningful expression that challenge uh, dominant narratives through the use of the public space. And this uh, use of the public space is very important, uh, mainly to those that can use the public space, those ones that in a certain way are a little bit denied by the use of the public space. And that situation is happening right now in Mexico. And Mexico is one of the turning cases that uh, follow or um, like or path is uh, the great uh, systematic uh, violence that is happening in Mexico towards women and that's and this situation is not it's not happening just in Mexico it's a global uh, situation that is emerging uh, in many in some countries more than others but uh, in Mexico we have this kind of systematic violence that is uh, following uh, or is followed by uh, another kind of uh, act of violence, but especially uh, this deny, this uh, fight against that violence that is happening is uh, um, is being contracted by uh, women in Mexico. Um, and women in Mexico are those ones who are uh, making this act of vandalism in a certain way that is uh, is bringing a question. Uh, and, and that's uh, kind of uh, the importance of vandalism. Vandalism is not just the material act, sino if, if not uh, everything that is behind that. And that's why our starting point is to understand that vandalism question rather than destroy then this is a practice uh, who establish, uh, who questions uh, the established norm, norms and interrogates the marginalization and centralization of a space. 
that's why this project aims to explore how vandalism alt alters the discourses around certain places and territories and who has the, the right to use it or who hasn't. Um, so through the use of the visuals and the imaginary that is that makes an accountability of the injustice founded in our social political spaces uh, through this action, through the through the act of vandalism is is how we approach to this act, uh, to this performance in a different way that in culturally, uh, in a conventional way, is understanding about this act. And uh, vandalism, vandalism in that certain aspect, in the, this certain context, uh, is about claiming the space. Uh, the trajectory of women's movement in Mexico is founded in a historical context of grievance that have evolved into the collective demand for change, for justice, particularly in the response to the whole this context of feminicide uh, and this kind of violence, underlying violence that is founded in our whole society. So this uh, impunity, this, uh, this context, this uh, whole, environment of violence against women leads women to vandalize the space, the, the public space, uh, to make uh, act of defame, defacement and destruction of public infrastructure, to claim the use, the right, the, the, the justice in the use of the space. And it's caught, and this situation is caught by many lens. Uh, by many cameras, by several cameras, offering an image that serves as a potent symbol of resistance. So it's not just the, 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 the person who makes the act of vandalism, it's also, we, we want to uh, bring attention also to the person that uh, take the, the image, take the photography and share it in this kind of making some kind of accountability. Uh, and here the accountability is about who is a, who must be accountable for the situation that is happening to women in Mexico. Uh, this is the, the 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 subject that women are questioning, and it's it's not just the state; it's the whole society that uh, through this act are supposed uh, to to be accountable for. Uh, uh, um, a counter uh, a context in which uh, every year every every day sorry every day uh, ten women are being killed in Mexico. So this kind of situation just uh, leave to this kind of actions about certain uh, group of women in the search for a better uh, quality life, a better uh, justice for for herself herself and their families. So this kind of actions that women are taking in Mexico leads to a challenge in the dominant narratives. Uh, and it's very special to find these kinds, these two groups in what women are making in Mexico. We have uh, the group that is supporting the action of vandalized, but the whole uh, social, sociocultural context in Mexico is against the vandalization of certain uh, certain places, and this uh, leaves you uh, with the the semiotic examination of this action uh, comprehend in comprehend uh, these two uh, postures uh, make that this exploration through uh, the, the the examination of the symbolic the, the symbolic language in visuals uh, very powerful um, because uh, between be, through this examination of the symbolic language used by the vandals as well as the one found that in the photographic image give us the possibility of interpret uh, the meaning behind the various acts of vandalism and their impact in the social norms 
And these actions, uh, there is an evident impact of the visual statements of public discourses and policy. Many laws are changing in Mexico uh, because these actions that women are leading, there are several uh, reforms and changing the um, such, uh, justice uh, context that, it ch that, that, that are changing thanks to this uh, act of vandalism and and the whole uh, use of this public space and the manage of the public uh, space through action of vandalism that is leading to this uh, visualization of the morning and the situation that women are, 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 are living in Mexico. So this situation that's uh, particular impo importance in a country like Mexico, in which the violence towards a gender in a specific niche or the one founded in the context of organized crime, it seems going out of control, even, even outside the frontiers of Mexico. And so speaking of these borders, uh, because one of the um, sectors that is uh, um, against the expression of women in the public space is, ob is obviously is, uh, the, 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 the government. So the government in last years has taken the task of putting these kind of barriers, these kinds of frontiers within the, uh, for the protection of the monuments and some uh, architectural landmarks. So this is, this takes leads us to to the analysis of the borders uh, as another case of study that is that is defined by the dynamic interplay that is found between vandalism as a territorial expression founded in different frontiers and borders. Uh, for example, in Texas, in the frontier with Mexico, ranches have fenced significant significant property damage tied to the search and illegal immigration at the southern border, with one rancher reporting $60,000 worth in damage because of this kind of vandalism that people is making through uh, the passage through between Mexico and the United States. Another case is uh, the Israeli defense forces that have been engaged in repairing border installation damage during conflict. Um, and again, is uh, this makes an initiative named "Returning Ice Ice to Gaza," focus on repairing areas of the border fence and cleaning ordinance. It's funny to see how these uh, examples focus not in the why uh, in the question of why the vandal is doing this kind of action of damaging uh, borders, but in the other in the in the other uh, part in the other uh, subject that is uh, the state and maybe this kind of actions through vandalism uh, makes uh, that for us to begin to return to the question that who is uh, why is this uh, peep, uh, this uh, this vandalism is question what is uh, arguing what so um, we have also uh, increased uh, some kinds of act of vandalism between the frontiers of India and Pakistan. And again, it's, it's uh, like a, it's some kind of situation, some kind of uh, um, uh, situation in which uh, we must see be beyond the act, the simple act, to understand and question why this kind of action is happening and through, through, towards who is uh, uh, direct, directed. Um, the systems uh, illustrate the multifaceted uh, challenge posed by vandalism and border, border installation from migration related damages to security concerns in conflict zones. So each case reflects the evolution of our or of urban and border walls from mere physical, physical barriers to platforms for, for expressing dissent and challenging narratives around immigration and social justice. Action and situation like this reveals a complex dialogue between symbols, space, and societies, challenging uh, dominant narrative of power. 
vandals challenged the territory using public spaces as platform to rewrite subjectivities, underlying the transforming power of vandalism as a semiotic practice advocating for a more inclusive understanding around identity resistance and justice. Uh, so we have that vandalism is founded in the interplay of powers and resistance, that vandalism redefines legal and political discourses and has an impact on public perception and the creation or transformation of policies and public spaces. And to, 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 to end, um, we, we should return to this, to the question or to address the question of where do we draw the line between vandalism as a legitimate cultural property from a, from a protest uh, or as a simply act of destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Carolina and Red. And uh, to stay in the same continent, I would like to invite uh, Sebastian Moreno to open up uh, our discussion with his comments. Many thanks, Grigoris and, and, and colleagues, and, and thank you for this interesting presentation. I've been doing some research on vandalism as well uh, during the times of, of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, which in Belgium was quite active at the time of, of the pandemic. And and I find your your uh, insights very very interesting. I was a bit troubled by the second part of the presentation because I I saw a type of romanticization of of vandalism, perhaps something that happens a lot nowadays. Uh, some political groups or or activist groups. Uh, are working hard to discursively justify vandalism as a legitimate practice. And in my view, it's very important that we remember, that we keep in mind that vandalism is something that is illegal, right? That, that, that there is a, a, a proper working of society. There are some, some norms and, and, and some sanctions that, that allow us to live together. Uh, so vandalism is very interesting as a semiotic practice, uh, particularly because of that, because it's an act of enunciation where someone takes the power, uh, autonomously, let's say, of creating meanings or destroying things that are there created by someone else and shouldn't be destroyed to produce new meanings. Uh, the, the presentation about the, the, the feminist move, movements in, in Mexico is very interesting. But, but I was a bit uh, worried because I, I saw this also in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Brazil. We see feminist movements uh, that really justify also from, from, from a theoretical perspective, the way of, of, of protesting linked to destroying property, right? So I, I understand this idea that, that Red proposed that, that vandalism is not about destroying, it's about questioning. I, I don't agree at all with that. Vandalism is about destroying above all. And that might be a carrier of meaning, yeah? But we can think, as it happens a lot in Latin America, drunk teenagers that go around walking at night in the city and destroying uh, parts of public property just for fun. So it's, 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 I, I'm a bit troubled about this idealization of romanticization of, of vandalism, which doesn't surprise me at all because I know it's, it's, it's uh, very common. It's a hegemonic discourse now. Uh, with, with, within the idea of, okay, we, the people, the powerless, need to show our our expression and, and, and what we think, so we are allowed to find the means that we have at the reach of the hand to, to do that. And, and, and I think any semiotic analysis needs to be very careful about leaving this, this uh, clear. And, and then going back to, to Monica's um, distinction between different types of... of, of um, uh, Monica's, no, sorry, Carolina's uh, present, uh, distinction about different types of, of uh, vandalism. I wonder if, if what happened with Mr. Bean and, 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 the, and the, the painting in, in that famous movie is actually or, or counts as a semiotic practice, right? Because when we do things by mistake, are we actually producing discourse? Are we actually uh, enunciating something or are we just leaving a track that then can be interpreted as as something that was created with a, a communicative intention. 
Um, so I, I would wonder, I wonder, because it's something I thought about also when I was um, working on, on the subject, uh, if the intentionality of what we are doing isn't a, a, a necessary condition for vandalism to, to occur. Uh, again, we can destroy public property, we can do stuff uh, unwillingly, but I am not convinced, at least in the in the meaning that that vandalism has in Spanish, uh, that that is enough to 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 for an action to count as as, as vandalism. Um, I don't know. This is a, a general re remark, but but I, I find the the person the, the topic you are researching very interesting. I think as semiotics of of vandalism and iconoclasm is it's very much needed particularly because these kind of practices are becoming very hegemonic and mainstream nowadays as a way of, of protesting and doing activism. And again, I repeat this idea, it's very relevant for us to, as semioticians, as scholars, to keep in mind that there is a norm, there is something that society sanctions and that these kind of practices normally consist of subjects, individuals or groups taking the power or giving themselves the, the authority to question that, right? And, and, and I think now as a, as a challenging topic as well, is this vandalism, isn't this vandalism? What happens in Spanish, for example, with inclusive language, right? Yeah, for for non-Spanish speakers, in Spanish, the, the plural is masculine. It's, 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 we speak of, of los hombres or or, or los humanos, it's, it's, it's a, a masculine uh, form from the grammatical point of view. And now feminist movements and activist movements are trying to destroy or use inclusive language which substitutes the norm and challenge it. And it happened to me, I don't use it at all, being a scholar and being a feminist and, and, and supporting any type of, of progressive uh, movements that tend to, to gain more, more space of power. I don't use it because I think it's, it's, it's not the way to, to proceed, but it has happened to me that attending seminars or stuff, I have to deal with the choice that the, the presenter does of using it as an authoritative mode of, of destruction. Right, so uh, this might be the question I, I, I would have for you. Do you think that vandalism applies also to what uh, some some groups are doing now to language, to Spanish language, as a way of subversing or changing the the norm that has been established for 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 many years? I would I will stop there, but I hope my my points my points were clear. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, now let's uh, move a bit north more to the north. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Chris Drone from the States. Hi, folks. Um, like, like Sebastian, I, I share some of the concerns about that, that very fine line between vandalism when used as a form of uh, protest or drawing attention or changing the narrative to a more direct form of action to then just outright violence. Dare I say, I wrote down in my notes here, uh, aesthetic warfare. Um, uh, I, this all reminded me of, of, of a moment, um, this was almost 20 years ago, I was heading home from the pub with a friend in downtown Toronto, and we were on Spadina Street, and um, we heard there was a party going on above the businesses on uh, in Chinatown there, and so we decided to crash the party because we saw people coming and going, and when we got upstairs, um, it, it was it was chaos. The, everybody, was they were wielding sledgehammers, and they were literally destroying the entire space. And in talking to people there, I'm like, what, what is going on here, right? They're like, well, this was an art collective and uh, the owner of the building recently sold. And uh, that means we're displaced. Our, uh, our lease is now null and void. And, you know, we're, we're, out, with, we're out of means of livelihood, right? <laughs> they, were, they were financially ruined uh, because of this action. So uh, in retaliation, they decided, well, you know, if they're going to mess with us and our livelihood, we're going to mess with them and we're going to completely destroy this place um, before they can, you know, effectively sell it or, or complete the contract. Um, a couple days later, it, it appeared in various art magazines around Toronto as an art installation called the Destroyers. Right? They were they had they had turned this this act of of protest and violence and, and destruction into a, an art piece itself. Um, you know, instead of art being vandalized, uh, the art was vandalizing back, which I find a fascinating kind of dialectic and play there. Um, but again, I, I I do wonder what this line is, if we can even demarcate what it might be uh, between, you know, art that is 
again, challenging narratives, um, is, is holding people to account, um, is using symbolic language to kind of change the narrative surrounding, you know, the, the more problematic uh, systemic injustices in our society. And, and then that point where it just degrades into like, no, now it's, it's about not just challenging the space, but outright condemning it. Let's, let's, let's have a scorched earth policy here and, and destroy this, this space um, because we just don't see it as a space where, where art is even possible anymore, perhaps. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there for you to comment on. Thank you both, great presentation. Thank you very much, Chris. And now let's move to the Abendland, the uh, chemistry of, uh, that is now uh, in the evening hours. And uh, give the floor to Piotr Sadowski from Dublin. Um, thank you, Gregory. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, Chris and Carolina and Red for the uh, um, very inspiring and illuminating and also, as I see it, complementary presentations. That's why they were put together. So uh, um, it's, thank you to, 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 to all of you and to, to the commentators. Um, uh, as, as you, Carolina and Sebastian, were talking about uh, uh, vandalism, art and vandalism, um, I was still thinking of Chris's first presentation. Um, he, he talked about graffiti as a, first of all, it exists, it's not going anywhere. It's not go going to be suppressed or banned although it is in some countries uh, uh, rendered uh, illegal criminal because it, it, it is treated as, as, as vandalism. So not only destruction of works of art, those uh, performances uh, in, in front of uh, uh, smartphone cameras in the Louvre of uh, throwing soup over uh, Mona Lisa, or the more serious uh, defacement of uh, cultural heritage going back uh, 1400 years to the antiquity, the blowing up of the Buddha statues by, by the Taliban. And there are numerous examples of, of that religious or ideologically motivated vandalism uh, uh, during the, the Reformation, the European Reformation, the, the, the iconoclastic early Protestants whitewashing um, wall paintings in the churches because they considered them blasphemous, sacrilegious. How can you? Uh, presume to 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 know what the deity and the holy family uh, looked like, things like that. And then I thought about the graffiti, not just destroying works of art, but maybe in some cases, a point could be made. Um, just 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 to, just to consider it, uh, treating something like graffiti is spontaneous. Uh, sort of grassroots, uncontrolled, an uncontrollable form of. Uh, imposition into public space, a form of vandalism. Um, it, it, politicians, uh, city governments have their reasons to protect uh, uh, public spaces and uh, uh, property, either public property, corporate property, or private buildings from, from being defaced because, um, well, uh, uh, Graffiti surrounds us everywhere, but if if it happens that someone paints something on our house, it certain uh, it somehow irks us more than it's, if if it's a corporate building. So uh, we we tolerate the phenomenon, but we don't always approve of it. Sort of the gut feeling is okay. Um, uh, it, it has to be somehow regulated, somehow controlled. So um, could the idea of vandalism be applied to certain forms of uh, art form itself, to, to the production, not just destruction of the, 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 the defacement of artworks, but to, to the production? How, how does that apply to, to graffiti? Um, can, uh, in, to what extent can this be considered an antisocial um, uh, uh, phenomenon? Um, it surrounds us everywhere in the urban space. There's no going away from it. Uh, we are used to it, uh, but some of us uh, are not that excited about it, really. Um, on the scale between Banksy and um, uh, some uh, rather spontaneous and amateurish uh, 
expressions of se- of self expressions. Uh, there is a scale. Something can attract attention. We can stop, look, analyze, listen, and enjoy it. And Banksy has created a, 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 a category of the masterpiece with it, that art form. But certain, uh, uh, well, unthought or un, uh, like unplanned. It, it's it, it's the excitement of the of the the, the doing something that that's not. Uh, fully legal, probably under the cover of, of the night. I don't know how they do it, but uh, 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 most of the, uh, the 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 graffiti uh, that we see and uh, in any city um, um, that, that I see in Dublin, where I live, um, is something that uh, uh, is a nice saw, basically, and uh, it's uh, it's it's an imposition of certain uh, visual stimuli that are always not always. Uh, agreeable. It's like loud music produced by buskers in the street, things like that. So uh, can those two um, uh, presentations and the concept of vandalism be uh, be, uh, be applied not only to the uh, defacing and destruction of works of art, but in some rare cases um, to the production of, work, uh, of, of art um, uh, itself? That's my question. Thank you very much, Piotr. And uh, we'll close uh, the round of commentators in the second session by moving a bit uh, later on in the time zone and inviting Pansahat Pachanan Mohandi from India to uh, contribute with his comments. Thank you very much. I enjoyed both the talks. Graffiti is not very popular in India as it is in the West. And uh, as we know, folk art and uh, folklore don't have signatures. Graffiti is also in many cases don't have signatures. So I assume they belong to the masses, the people, common people. Uh, what we have in India is that it's not happening right now. As you, all of you know, India had a strong oral culture. And earlier, I have seen those things in my childhood. You know, a lot of uh, small singer groups, they would come and sing something which can be compared with whatever graffiti is doing today in the West. They would go from village to village, do that. Sometimes solo singers also do come. And I don't know uh, if I have time, you know, we can probably compare whether they can be compared with the gra- whatever the graffitis are doing in the Western culture or not. So it's very fascinating kind of thing. They used to sing and go from place to place and do something similar. You know, it had both the things, a voice as well as a weapon. They sensitize people they instigate within courts people to do certain things against whatever the um, government was doing or somebody else was doing. Um, The second point that I want to make is that it's time we started combining um, this kind of discussion with linguistic landscaping. So I saw, you know, when the presentations were made, um, I saw different colors, different uh, font sizes being used in the graffitis, you know, uh, that's quite important. That has to be taken into consideration. Linguistic landscaping doesn't take into consideration the, um, you know, uh, except language, it doesn't consider other things. So, but here we are, of course, there was some discussion on language, but it should be taken in a little serious way. The other point I want to make is that India, in India, because it's a multilingual country, I find you know, same kind of thing written in two, three languages. And which language is first, which language is next, which language is third, and what kind of font size, letter size, and all those things. And sometimes even letters are mixed. One letter from one language, the other letters from another language. So this kind of thing is uh, quite fascinating for me. And, uh, you know, I'm really delighted to hear these things. I'm sure I'll start thinking about all those things because graffitis, as I mentioned again, are not a major kind of thing on the Indian walls, but 
you know, there sometimes once in a while we find these things in big cities like Delhi or uh, Mumbai. So nothing much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And uh, Carolina and Red, you have the floor. I think you have plenty of feedback there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I'll I'll start, Red. Is that okay? Um, yeah. First of all, uh, thanks. All, all the points are very well taken. Um, and we we do really appreciate the consideration that was given to uh, to the questions that were asked. Um, I I think it's important to to understand that we're not taking a position on what's happening. We are exploring it. So in terms of romanticization, uh, I think that's a really important concern, especially with respect to the becoming hegemonic of these kinds of practices on the parts of many kinds of movements. And there's a lot of romanticization of graffiti as well, which is kind of falls under the umbrella of, of vandalism writ large, though it's not completely our specific interest. And so the question of property and the destruction of property um, and the question of value and then things that people have to pay that is tied up into bigger political contexts, right? So in the context of feminist movements, because we do have an important chapter of the book that is going to be about the women's movement in Mexico, um, this idea of the enunciative act and enunciation through an act that is inherently violent is a kind of response to the violence on women's bodies that's not seen. So it is a, re a violent response to a violence. And again, we're not really standing on either side of this, but we're looking at this as the way the semiotic contestation uh, that's happening. And uh, I think Rhett can expand on that a bit more, but I just want to touch on a couple of other things first. Um, yeah, we don't know. There are some destructions of images that is that falls into group E, the, the people that don't care the accidental vandals, uh, like Mr. Bean, um, what's the semiotic import? It, it doesn't matter because it, it was a bunch of drunk teenagers that destroyed something. And that's, that's a category of vandalism, right? That's, that's not our main focus, but it is a category that, that, you know, it's there, it's vandalism, but we don't see it as a semiotic communication because it doesn't have a, a serious communicative import. Um, but I think the Mr. Bean scenario does because it's not an actual act of vandalism. It's a movie representation of a vandalism. And so the movie representation, and we have a chapter in the book that looks at pop culture and, and we'll talk about Glass Onion and the burning of the Mona Lisa and different acts of destruction that occur in film, in video games, in uh, comics and other pop culture. And what it's doing is it's making a comment on the art world and the value of that art and how often art is valued, overvalued. It's a bit of a farce. It's a bit of a commercial game, a corporate co-optation. And it's also looking at how people's own lives and bodies are devalued. They're worth less than the art. And that, that was the point of the Taliban. Uh, that the Taliban was making. And and I'm not condoning their action, but I'm just saying it's almost the same point that they make in Glass Onion when they burn the Mona Lisa, that the, they didn't care about the people that died. They care more about the painting, right? And, th and that's that's part of the, the message of a, a lot of this stuff is sort of tied together. Um, so I think that I, we also take seriously the... Um, the idea of language and subverting language and how subverting language is also a way to subvert the terms of a conversation. So this applies to Spanish and and how and the sort of contestation of, of genderizing uh, nouns and verbs and how it's technically not grammatically correct, but it's surfacing a, a problem. Um, and I like, uh, Chris, the idea of aesthetic warfare. Um, do we condone it or not? It's it's important to discuss it because um, 
why do people end up resorting to violence? You know, is it senseless? Is it sense making? Um, what can semiotics offer this? And so this is really what we're asking is, it's a question what matters and how and um, and to whom, right? And, and when, in which context? So we do look at the dynamic of destruction as production. Every time an image is destroyed, a new image is created, the image of the destroyed image. You know, the Taliban is now selling tickets for people to go see where the Buddhas used to be. <laughs> so it's similar to your warehouse example. And it could be an antisocial phenomenon, but it could be a shift in progress in terms of what counts as the hegemonic expression. And, um, you know, we have art, the Iconoclash exhibition, for example, was an exhibition of destroyed art. Um, there have been exhibitions of the not art, right? So it it's sort of the the dialogue with different audiences that uh, that we're interested in, and I'm I'm just gonna let it go there because I I want uh, Rhett to have a chance to respond as well. But I'm I'm happy to entertain uh, these points. I think they're really important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, the, the 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 talk sounded a little bit romanticizing in the factors of vandalism. Yeah, I want to assure you that uh, it's not in that sense. But we have, uh, as Carolina said, uh, this kind of question ourselves uh, also that uh, what matters most, and also to uh, this is going to be like uh, very decisive in the form we understand the the the, the word uh, destruction i think is uh, uh the turning point like uh, if how we put uh, the word destruction in the context of vandalism uh, to give it maybe a little bit more uh, approach in the sense of a cultural property, even the destruction of things, if we have the time to analyze the whole context that is happening, the destruction of some, something, uh, maybe we can give this kind of uh, cultural property on the fact of uh, vandalize a public building or a monument because sadly I'm very kind of the part of and we 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 must localize in the fence of uh, things change and something that is happening in the culture of Mexico and the society of Mexico is we uh, seems we give more importance to a piece of monument that is uh, that is having a, a context of identity of history from two 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 hundred years ago, and the actions that women are making in these uh, physical spaces in this uh, monument or pieces of architecture um, is something that maybe must be uh, even guarded for the understanding of the people in the future. And the understanding of the people in the future, when we when they see this, let's let's put a like a monument that has been vandalized, is that in Mexico women are being killed in these times. It is something that maybe we must preserve like a cultural property to understand the history in Mexico right now, not the history just, and this uh, maybe follows a little bit the idea of these layers of history, of these high layers of understanding about who made the first act of vandalism and who uh, made this graffiti and after uh, put out another line. Uh, history is uh, making about layers. And in this time, in this period, I think, that it's important to recognize that vandalism also can be a layer or understanding about our context and what's happening and what is defined in our social and political context. Um, that's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. And to maintain the momentum of uh, our discussion, 
Uh, I suggest that we move to our final stage and uh, start uh, or rather uh, invite our presenters to uh, raise issues that uh, concern both of them, perhaps. And uh, although my role is not uh, to raise questions today, I simply to coordinate, please allow me to make to start off this last stage in our discussion by raising uh, by making a couple of points regarding both presentations. Uh, I have the feeling that in both cases, uh, the presenters have uh, adopted uh, a broad approach to their topic. If I uh, allow to borrow the term uh, from Rosal Krauss, uh, the expanded field of sculpture and adapted to our context. Uh, in the case of Chris, we have an expanded field of graffiti. In the case of Carolina and Brett, we have the expanded field of vandalism. And by expanded, just like uh, in the original uh, use made by, uh, by Rosanne Krauss, the, the concept of, of expansion here refers to a kind of heterogeneity, a kind of uh, multiplicity of different practices. Um, and thus uh, uh, a kind of, of, of creation of new uh, interrelationships and uh, dynamization of different spaces rather than a specific orientation or a specific uh, direction. The second common point in both presentations, I think, is their focus on the uh, countercultural aspect of both of graffiti and vandalism. In other words, uh, they both approach their topic in terms of uh, some kind of cultural warfare or cultural or symbolic warfare. Um, they have used relevant terms in their in their presentations, um, and in, in in this respect, I, uh, I would like to to, to point to this issue of uh, communicability, or rather the, the communicative the communicative intention, so to speak. Uh, in in many cases, in the, in when talking about graffiti, I have the feeling that the primary intention is not to communicate, uh, but rather to oppose uh, established codes of communication. Whereas in the case of uh, vandalism, as discussed by Carolina and Red, there is a very clear point in communicating because there's such a powerful political message behind it, which has to be communicated. Uh, for example, political graffiti is highly communicable, a highly communicated act. It has to be legible, understood, to be shared with a wider uh, 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 public. Um, so perhaps there we may find a divergence that uh, vandalism wants to be understood as such. It's a very highly, uh, uh, highly effective uh, uh, gesture. Uh, that wants to be comprehended in 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 terms of its message, uh, but uh, not always uh, graffiti, which wants to be understood mostly on a gestural uh, 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 level, on a, on, a, on, a, on the level of gestural, let's say, rhetoric, rather than of a clearly communicated message of what it is about. And uh, to return to the wonderful case study or incident that uh, Chris began his presentation with, the, the, these high rise towers uh, with graffiti all over. Uh, our artists there have uh, didn't have any qualms in uh, doing away with their favorite uh, uh, canvas, the wall. They used the balconies which I think it was made of glass, if I'm not mistaken. And <laughs> so their peculiar and rather risky acrobatics involved using a different kind of, 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 of canvas. Um, and uh, But as I said, these are simply some rough thoughts, simply to kick off uh, 
our last stage. So if you have the floor, you can take uh, uh, you know, the initiative and start uh, the discussion between you. I saw I saw Terry as well. You had your hand raised. Oh, um, yep. Terry, yep. I yes, but it it doesn't follow what you were talking about, Gregory. I just had a had a comment slash question to Carolina uh, after the presentation. Thank you for the presentation. But you, in one of your answers, you 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 gave the example of the the category E of vandals, the ones that do it unknowingly. And and you said that it doesn't have a real communicative import. Uh, and personally, I would say that it actually has one of the most significant communicative imports. If we take an example like uh, a, an animal that vandalizes something. So it's still a human property. Uh, somebody has put up a fence and a bear comes along and it vandalizes that fence. So from the human perspective, we still say it's a vandal or, or an act of vandalism, but the bear doesn't understand the concept. But I think that the communicative import of the bear showing that it doesn't agree with this claim of property is very, very significant in, in defining that concept of vandalism because we all need to understand the concept to even, the concept of property to even consider that we can understand the concept of vandalism. So I thought that that even the ones being vandals unknowingly, I think they are very important in, in the story. I just wanted to share that. Thank you so much for that thought. You know, um, I was thinking more of sort of the accidental drunks, but you're right, um, of course. We, we have a chapter on green vandalism and, uh, you know, part of this is also what's the role of nature? It's it's not just the the bear on the fence, which is a great example, but you know there are rivers that cities pave over that then resurface, right? And and they continue to resurface and they continue to impose their existence on this desire to create this urban landscape on top of of what was there. And so, you know, I feel that we can ascribe meaning to that uh, in terms of the human will to expand and to impose itself on nature, uh, disregarding uh, any consideration of it and treating nature as a resource and instead of a, a living part of who we are. So there are worldviews and there are perspectives that would take that very seriously. And I, and I thank you for that comment. I think that that's an important way to look at category E is the, the zoo semiotics of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe I can uh, I could just respond to um, to the comment of the uh, the romanticism um, because I have to admit, <clears throat> uh, uh, Carol Carolina and Rhett uh, denied romanticism. I, I don't think I can deny my romanticized <laughs> graffiti. Uh, we, I, I did. And this is what I meant when I said at the end of my presentation that there's an ethics here, as well as there's a a, a comment on aesthetics, uh, a comment on whether or not something is, is going to be art. And and to uh, uh, Peter's, uh, Peter's um, comment as well, if, if if I step out of my house and somebody has spray painted graffiti on my, my house, um, I mean, if it's extremely aesthetically pleasing, perhaps, but nonetheless, it's... <laughs> It, it's not so simple, is it? It's not so simple when, it, you know, uh, and so I, I admit that, you know, there's this element and this is what, and I, this is, I do want to pass this over to my co-presenters. Are you sure that you're not going to romanticize it? Because, you know, when we're th thinking about speaking space and we're thinking about representation and we're thinking about the narratives, you know, I think that we might. I mean, I, I might anyway, certainly. Um, but I think, again, the, the, obviously the, the, the larger goal, and, and this reminds me of, I remember when I was doing my tattoo research and I had this interview with a reporter and at the end of our conversation, and it was a, it was a, it was a long conversation. He said to me, Hey, can, can I tell you something? I said, sure. He said, I don't like tattoos. 
he said, I'm doing this interview, you know, because it's my job. He said, but I really think that they're an eyesore. And we, and we, I got reminded, we used to use the, right? and I said to him, um, of course, my goal is not to make you get tattooed. My goal is just to have you seeing them differently, understanding the, the, the many layers beneath them, um, but not to necessarily get them. So, um, you know, again, the goal will be broadly, and as you say, uh, Gregory, very broad to, to just try to my best to to represent it. But I, you know, again, to there is going to be an element of um, giving speaking space to certain certain sides and and representation, and all of this is something I'm interested in. So I wonder, I wonder, uh, Carolina and Rhett, are you sure you're not going to romanticize vandalism? <laughs> I'm I'm going to take that uh, first. Uh, sorry, Carolina. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure. I I don't want to in an objective way, but just in the fact that. Uh, we are dealing with the fact of vandalism as a cultural property is uh, romanticized, uh, seen like a, a piece of heritage that deserves to be saved, to be guarded, uh, as the same as the monument in the first place, uh, without being touched. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's a posture, and it's a posture that even becomes a little bit strong if you add the political, socio-political context that uh, the cases of vandalism that we are analyzing, analyze, uh, we are going to analyze, analyze uh, for sure, for sure. Uh, all the pieces of, of uh, the chapters are resuming in injustices, uh, resuming in, in things that maybe are not the proper way uh, to express uh, the, uh, the social context that we live in. Uh, and some kind of uh, rebellious actions against that is, is, is hard. It's, it's hard to not get uh, emotionally involved. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll add to that, that, you know, there is a lot of affective charge to a lot of the marks and graffiti and uh, violent destruction even that that uh, people make. Um, but when you're looking at it in context of abuse, of rape, of killing, it's very hard to romanticize. It's a scream of pain. And sometimes it's the only way um, that people have of trying to be heard in a particular context. So I think that, of course, there's a danger of, of romanticizing depending on the context uh, when we're looking at border walls, when we're looking at children being separated from their parents, many of them probably now dead or sold into human trafficking, it's just not a topic that um, we have a right to romanticize. I think we have to ground ourselves firmly in the politics of it. And that's and the political is really uh, where we're coming at this from. Now, obviously, if some of these uh, marks or or the vandalism turns out to be aesthetically powerful. Um, you're looking at murals of George Floyd in 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 front of police stations or and so on and so forth that that people rally around. Then there is a romanticizing force of the publics that are taking these things up. But in many cases. Um, the acts that we look at are ephemeral. They're erased the next day. They are covered over by police, but they are captured digitally and then shared. And so what, what we're hoping to do is um, track the presence of these digitally. Uh, we have a chapter on sort of the digital side of this where um, publics are being formed around the cascades of comments and rallying around it. And so I guess you could you could say that there's a romanticization happening there where where people gather around a particular act and it it um impacts their subjectivity. But I think that uh, we really do have to be careful around that question when we're talking about questions of life and death, when we're talking about human survival, um and when we're talking about human beings being pitted against property, human beings being treated as less than property or as property itself. Um, that's that's kind of where it's not just about 
aesthetics and ethics, but there's a morality that that we have to engage here. So we're, we will be kind of looking at some really difficult questions. I think the question of romanticism is a really important one because we have to be careful around that. I think we really have to think about it and then we really have to be careful around that. And um, I wouldn't want to commit to either side of that, you know? Um, I would want to be able to analyze something on the terms of the context that we elucidate around it using the theoretical lenses that that we uh that we're engaging. So, you know, I don't know what else to say. There's a lot. <laughs> but thanks uh, Karina, for the question. Karina, don't you find um <clears throat> when you feel that there is um some kind of tension between a, a cultural poetics of vandalism? and the account of cultural poetics of Andrews. Meaning that, uh, let's take the example, when the Soviet uh, monuments were brought down, there is still lots of people who think of this as a monumental act of vandalism. Uh, so uh, if we take uh, vandalism as in its uh, cultural poetical, dimension. It is uh, something more uh, general, more widespread, even Taliban can be heroes in that sense, because they, you know, they destroyed uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the monuments of a religion uh, that uh, at some point, distant in time, perhaps for our memories, uh, occupied the, uh, the specific uh, regions. Uh, the cultural uh, uh, the countercultural poetics is is simply part. Is it a distinct semiotically part? Uh, how, how these uh, two those two perspectives can can be reconciliated? Well, I think you're right. I think they're intention, and uh, you know, time and memory are important aspects to consider. Because if you look at the Hagia Sophia in Turkey, and you look at how it was originally uh, covered in frescoes in the early Christian period that were then covered over with Arabic script because of the iconoclasm of that. And then in Ataturk's time, you had both. And now again, we're back to um, Arabic script. And yet at the same time, on one of the handrails in the upper gallery of the Hagia Sophia, you have Viking graffiti. I mean, someone scratching their name into the marble. Um, and that's become a historical sort of mark that the Vikings were these mercenaries hired by the Ottomans in their wars, you know, and that the Vikings were there in, in uh, Istanbul, formerly Constantinople. So I think there's the historical view that you can take at the at the space as a site of contestation. And I think that when you when you look at cultural heritage and you look at these questions, it's important to think about spatializations and and how space is also part of the semiotic, but time as well. Um, and I really don't know how we're going to do that because it's really hard, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll try. I mean, it's it's a point very well taken. As uh, we we. Didn't take up any questions from our participants. Uh, Chiri, you have a point to raise. Well, we, we can go to to the audience as well. I'm taking up enough time. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. Um, well, so, if, uh, I, if I could, um, just one other question that you had, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. was uh, was really um, it was about um, uh, the graffiti could be gestural, not necessarily specifically conversational or meant to evoke. Uh, it's not necessarily a communicative act. It could just be gestural. It could just be. Um, and then someone earlier mentioned art for art's sake. And uh, I find um, I, that's something I'm 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 genuinely interested in in exploring because, uh, again, I, I because of my past experience with the tattoo research, I, I draw a lot of parallels. And I remember a big topic that comes up with that is people say, well, it doesn't have meaning. People would say, well, it's, it wasn't, this wasn't a, a way for me to communicate. It was, it didn't have meaning. And the more I would probe them, the more you'd realize that not, no meaning is meaning. 
meaning is and 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 no communication is communication you know so and it's it's a, it gets a little bit more complicated um and and so in this way i also wonder as well um because someone else also mentioned earlier i don't think i i heard the word meme at some point but just the fact that all of the layers to these things you know whether or not something is communicating could just depend on whether or not you have the ability to decode what is being communicated um and so I think that's something that that uh, that both of our works are going to offer, which is ways to decode something which may just pass by you as perhaps pointless or or without meaning or without uh, desire for for communication. Uh, uh, let me make myself more clear. Uh, for example, when when graffiti takes a, a more iconographic. Uh, uh, um, uh, form, for example, in street art, uh, Banksy, for example, it 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 has a very clear statement, hmm? or where when it is a political graffiti hmm? slogan or something, a message of some sort. Uh, I'm not saying that it is meaningless the the wild style, the so-called wild style in graffiti, but its meaning concerns more something that is on the affective uh, dimension rather than the discursive. Hmm? So it is not uh, the meaning, its meaning rather derives mostly out of its uh, explicit, if you like, uh, uh, subversion of common codes of legibility or readability uh, which, in other words, in other in other ways, rules over public space. Hmm? Uh, every kind of public meaning has a clear aim to be legible, uh, clear, you know, explicit, and so forth. Um, so it is a kind of, you know, the, it's it's a it's a kind a variant of the biblical writing on the wall. Hmm? It is a writing, but what's the meaning of it? It's strange. It's wild. It's uh, ferocious. It's uh, uh, it has more to do with a sentiment, uh, or in Lyotard's terms, uh, it is tensive. It is not discursive. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and now I remember uh, there is even a, 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 a specific subcategory of tattoos which concern graffiti, graffiti tattoos. Isn't it? That's a that's a nice way to to, to relate to your previous project. Yes, yeah, and a lot of uh, you see a lot of, of graffiti artists who transition into becoming tattoo artists as well. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So from the social skin to the individual skin. I like that. Um, I just received a message from uh, um. From Piotr, that uh, not from Piotr. From uh, uh, the people who are responsible for our link, that uh, we are out of time, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, we will soon be uh, blackened in uh, screens. <laughs> so um, let me say how grateful I am to our presenters for the wonderful and so exciting and uh, you know, fascinating presentations. I think uh, they have offered us uh, really uh, uh, smart presentations tonight. And of course, our panelists who have enhanced our webinar with uh, their comments and uh, thoughts. And of course, all our attendees who have suffered through almost two and a half hours of uh, 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 the longest, I think, uh, smart webinar in, in its uh, history. Uh, I wish you all well. Uh, good luck with your projects. And uh, hope to see you again uh, soon in another of our smart webinars. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very good much. Night. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you.